Dear Heavenly Father, now as we open up your word, we ask for a special blessing and anointing of the Holy Spirit so that our hearts may be open and uh, that we may be changed by your word. Um, help us, Lord, to apply these things to our own lives um, so that we are not just um, listening and then going home and not remembering. Help us, Lord, to uh, take these things, these concepts, and and let them be a part of our life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You'll notice today that uh, our sermon title is They Were So Young. Um, I know sometimes when I look at uh, TV and I see uh, young people who are doing great things, um, I think, wow, they were so young. Or sometimes if we see um, something really bad happen uh, over the week, you know, with all the things with the immigration of uh, refugees, um, we had a very horrible picture of a toddler face down on the beach who had passed away, who had drowned and washed up on the beach. And you look at that horrible picture and you think, ha, oh, he was so young. And youth has a special place in our hearts. Um, for those of us who are older, we wish for our youth sometimes. Uh, you even hear the saying of, uh, oh, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> you know, we think if they only knew what we knew, they would be doing things differently. And so there's a, a lot of stuff that goes along with uh, when we think about the youth. And there's some special things we need to think about in the context of youth and our church. And uh, today's key thought, uh, hopefully no one has any rocks in their pocket, but today's key thought is this. The young people of our church are not our future. Okay, like I said, hopefully no one has any stones. I'll finish that key thought a little bit later on in my sermon, but I want you to think about that. The young people of our church are not our future. What could I possibly mean by that? Okay, um, today's sermon is uh, the two sources that I have are really, really interesting website, uh, Adventist Heritage. And if you've never visited that website, you should do it because they have some of the best stories and resources on that website. And so a lot of the historical things that I'll talk about today, they were so young in our church founding, will come from that website. The other resource I have is from the uh, Youth Ministries uh, Manual for Pastors and Elders. And they have a lot of good stuff in there that helps us to understand our relationship uh, with youth in the church. So those are my two sources for today, and I really encourage you to visit that website. It's really well put together, um, very colorful, and a lot of good stuff in there. So when we think of the founding of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, um, the image of our founders tends to be of old, wrinkly, bearded, middle-aged men, right? And um, we, we, we have a hard time identifying with them as young people, um, but realize that those pictures were taken much later. Um, those are not pictures taken of our, of our Adventist leaders when um, at the starting of the church. Uh, in fact, uh, it's really interesting because when you really look at the founders of our church, um, we often don't realize how diverse they were. Um, they were diverse in terms of age, they were diverse in terms of gender, and they were, uh, they were diverse in terms of ethnicity at a time when really the only game in town was white, old, and male, um, the Adventist church was on the very cusp of, of, uh, of bringing everyone into the fold of Jesus Christ and being inclusive. And it's interesting because the majority of those who started the church were abolitionists and were very, very active in that movement. And so um, perhaps the photos that we see of, of some of the founders uh, mislead us in our thinking of who they were. Um, during the uh, formative years of the movement, 
um, the leaders of our church were very young. Very young. In fact, uh, at the Great Disappointment in 1844, James White was only 23 years old. Only 23. In fact, um, James, a few years before the Great Disappointment, um, decided to become a uh, preacher and was certified and licensed for that at the age of 21 years old. And he, uh, in that first year, uh, after preaching for a little while, they sent him out on a, uh, a tour. So, and you know, there wasn't easy traveling during that time in the uh, mid 1800s. And they sent him out on a tour. It was for four months. And he went from town to town preaching and preaching. Uh, and uh, sometimes there were actually mobs out in the street trying to disrupt the services. And after the four months when he came back, um, take a guess at how many uh, people were converted to Jesus Christ in that four months. Anyone have a guess? No, a little bit too high. A thousand people. A thousand people. And you know, that's in four months, so you think that's about 250 a month, right? And if you think, well, in a month he probably visited maybe four or five uh, places, uh, different villages and so forth. And so, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, a good amount of people every week. I mean, what would we do if uh, 80 people walked through the door uh, each week of the month and wanted to be baptized? That would be an amazing thing. But it was because of his sincerity and his his uh, passion. He wanted to tell people about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, at the disappointment in 1844, Ellen White and Anne's, uh, Annie Smith, uh, Uriah Smith's sister, they were just 16 years old. And uh, John N. Andrews, he was 15. Uh, Minerva Lowenborough was not quite 15 years old. Um, Uriah Smith and, and John N. Lowenborough, uh, brothers of Annie and Minerva, they were only 13. And then George Butler, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him as a founder of the religion, but... He was only 10, 10 years old, 10 years old. And so these very young, except for James, they were all children, weren't they? And so after the great disappointment, they could have, as young people said, oh, those old people don't know anything. We were right. <laughs> but that's not what they did. They took the leadership position in going around and creating Bible conferences where they would study and they would, um, they would argue and talk about and debate and decide on the core beliefs of our church today. Those young children did that. Of course, they had help. Joseph Bates at uh, the Great Disappointment, he was 52, and he did give them some mentoring and leadership. And we're thankful for that. And it's a good example of how we as a church work together, leaders of the church and the youth. So one of the things that we uh, need to think about here is that it is possible for young people, very young people, to not only be interested in Bible study and that they can also take that leadership. And we need to give them that opportunity. Um, today, um, one of the things that we see about those pictures of the pioneers later in life, um, we forget that our founders were in their 20s and 30s when they founded the church. So let's look again at our key text now. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. You know, uh, Paul isn't advising Timothy um, to take care of anyone who is disrespecting him. That's not what he's saying at all. Really what he's saying is that he shouldn't let these people with a bad attitude and with um, things to say about his youth that he can do nothing about 
He should not let that get to him, right? And so many of our youth today, um, when they're given an opportunity to go forward and do little things in the church, so many times you have one or two people who maybe uh, frown at them or, or, or criticize something that they said or did or how they did it, and their spirits are broken. And I would tell the youth of the church that you, just like Paul, you cannot be broken by those attitudes or those words or those looks. You have to um, be encouraged. And um, someone once said uh, that the best revenge is a good life. Have you ever thought about that? When um, when people are are trying to get at you and and trying to tear you down, um, getting back at them usually only leads to sadness and hate and disappointment and discouragement. Really, the best revenge is a good life. And the second part of that passage today really uh, emphasizes that. You know, how does Paul feel that Timothy should not let people despise him for his youth? Well, he gives that. He says, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. And so for the youth of our church, one of the things that I would tell you is that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you should commit your lives to this concept of living well, of being an example of love and faith and purity. If you do that, what can people say against you? And so these are the things that Paul gives um, Timothy as far as tools to put in his belt. And we can also, as adults and leaders in the church, take that too. Because who among us has not been criticized? You know, uh, the minute you step up here or you step in front of a classroom, um, or you even get up to tell a children's story. It seems like in some churches there uh, that puts a, a, a bullseye on you. And so we as Christians really need to take his words and apply them to our own lives as adults. It's tough, but um, we can do it through the power of God, right? So looking at uh, youth involvement in the church, uh, taking this from Youth Minister's Manual and Pastors and Elders, it states this, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that the only way in which youth need to be involved in the church is through the youth program. It says, this is an error. Um, It is important that the youth program not be isolated from the rest of the church. In addition to their participation in the youth organization, the young people should be integrated into the responsible leadership and involvement in the entire church program. There should be young elders, young deacons and deaconesses, working with experienced church officers in all lines of church work, and you should be active. That's a quote from the uh, Youth Ministries Manual for Pastors and Elders. That's pretty, how many of us, I'd never heard that before, before I read that. And I thought, that is really some marching orders. And uh, that's a challenge for us. Uh, Many of us as church leaders, that's a challenge. You think, oh, young elders, isn't that an oxymoron? You know, but um, this idea of taking them under our wing and mentoring them to a greater place, a higher place, is something really important to Jesus Christ. We see how he did that with his own disciples. He didn't pick men that were perfect. He picked men who who needed some mentoring. They weren't in the place they needed to be to do the things they needed to do for the kingdom. And, uh, you know, you hear that old saying that um, that... God doesn't call those who are perfect. He calls those who are willing, and then he equips them with what they need to do. And this is a really important concept, especially when we're talking about us dealing with the youth and bringing the youth up. You know, because one of the things that uh, that happens is uh, giving the youth 
or the children of our church, these leadership positions, these little um, jobs to do, is risky. Why is it risky? Well, um, I forget who it was that uh, that in the movies he said, uh, never work, he was an actor, somebody help me out. He was an actor and he said, never work with children or dog or animals, right? Is that a field? And it's because they're both unpredictable. And so sometimes we have to have faith in those children in the church and take a risk. And uh, because, you know, Jesus Christ does that with us, does he not? None of us are perfect. All of us, anyone who has been in the church for a while or been leaders in the church, haven't we all made mistakes? Yeah. And so uh, when our uh, when our youth come in and they have a leadership position and they make a mistake, what should our response be? Our response should be the same as Jesus. Um, but uh, people, and especially children, are going to make mistakes. Our response needs to be Christ-like and nurturing, and it needs to be in the context of mentoring and wanting the best for our children and the best for our church. Um, one of the things that, um, that it talks about in that manual is pastors and elders um, cooperating with you. And I would take this further to say any leader in the church. Any leader in the church needs to uh, work with the youth. Now, what does that mean and what does the manual talk about? Well, this is what it says. It says youth need to see that their elders and leaders are working alongside them, supporting and getting to know them. And, you know, that's really important because one of the key things that happens with young people, and I would even say not so young people, is, uh, is this. Youth are not only empowered by involvement, but youth grow through relationships. And if, if there are not relationships between the youth and the leaders of the church and other congregation members in the church, then what happens? Well, one of the things we've seen in the last 20 to 30 years is an exodus, but not into the church, out of the church, of our youth. The youth are leaving the church in droves. And so one of the most important things that we can do is keep what we have. One of the ways that we do that is by garnering those relationships with people. And this goes for those who come into the church and are baptized, but especially for our youth. You know, not every child has Christian parents. And even those in the church who do have Christian parents um, need other Christian adults that they can look up to and that can give them a word here or there, a word of encouragement, a word of guidance, 
Because everyone knows that children don't listen to their parents. <laughs> they don't. They want to hear these things from other people too. I remember when we went to the Glad Reaper a few weeks ago, um, my two ch girls who went with me, um, they had had enough of mom within two hours of being there. Um, we had a breakout session and we had to go and talk about what we had learned and um, it became confrontational at, because of the dynamic between child and parent. And that happens. It's natural. There's nothing wrong with the child. There's nothing wrong with the parent. It's just kind of the dynamic that happens. And it was interesting because after that, we went back in, we had another 30, 45 minutes of session, and then we got to go to lunch. And at lunch, man, those girls, they can walk fast. They were down that hill and in line for lunch like that. And me and Dad were trying furiously to keep up. Well, we ended up being a few places behind them in line. And it was interesting because they weren't real happy with us, but they were sure chatting up the adults that were in line with them. And those adults were asking about their their um, experience here at the, at the Glad Reaper and what was going on. And boy, they were just talking with them and enjoying themselves. Why? Because those weren't their parents. Youth need someone besides their parents to talk to about spiritual matters. They need other people in the church, good Christian men and women, who can talk with them, take them under their wing, show them the way it goes. Parents can't be the be-all, see-all, because it just doesn't work that way. You know, one of the things that we see with um, with kids is that they don't always follow through. And one of the... Um, one of the examples that we have about that in the New Testament is um, about Barnabas and John Mark. And we see this play out in several different chapters in Acts. And one of the things that we see, sorry about that, um, one of the things that we see is that uh, things went well for a while. John Mark was young. And uh, Barnabas and Paul were having a lot of success with their evangelistic efforts. Um, but, of course, evangelism wasn't easy back then. There wasn't a nice, clean uh, car to jump into and drive to your destination. There wasn't a, a beautiful airliner to hop in and go clear across the world. Um, they had to depend on uh, spotty transportation at best, and it was a hardship. And at some point... What happened to John Mark? He became discouraged. It was hard. And you know, sometimes discouragement can overcome our youth. And what does our response need to be? Well, we see two things play out in this example, right? We see the response of Barnabas, and we see the response of Paul. Does anyone remember what happened? Well, we well, let's go ahead and turn in our in our Bibles to Acts chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 36 through 40. Acts chapter 15 verses 36 through 40. It says, Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Sounds like a good plan, right? So then uh, verse 37, Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them, the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. So Paul was not happy with John Mark. He felt that John Mark quit. 
He felt that John Mark wasn't to be trusted. He felt that John Mark gave up too easily. He wasn't faithful. He wasn't true. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. But what did Barnabas think? What did Barnabas think? Now Barnabas uh, was determined to take him, but uh, Paul said no. And then verse 39, Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Now that was a conflict. There's, here's a youth who got discouraged and gave up. He was a quitter. He wasn't faithful. He didn't do what he was supposed to do. He left. He left his responsibility. And Paul, being a um, very faithful man, he said, uh-uh, we're not going to make that mistake again. He is not going with us. And Barnabas said, no. We, we can give people second chances. We can give people second chances. That was Barnabas. He said, no, we're taking him with him. And it got so heated that they actually separated. And Paul went his way in his evangelistic series. And Barnabas felt so strongly about giving youth a second chance that he started his own evangelistic series with John Mark and went out on his own. And you think, well, okay, well, what can we learn from that? Well, here it, here it is. Churches are filled with people from different places and backgrounds and different biases. And some of our adult leaders um, are not going to give youth second chances. And when that happens, those of us who feel strongly about the youth and wanting to give them that opportunity to take ownership of their church, we need to be willing to stand our ground. I'm not saying we should have a huge split in the church, but we need to be willing to stand up for those young people. We each need to be someone who stands alongside that young person and says, no, no, this person is going to do great things. And you know, we should do that. Why? Because Christ does that for us. Christ, every single day, stands alongside us, holds our right hand. And even when we make dumb mistakes, even at times when we defy Christ, he is faithful to us. And He is always our advocate. He's always there. And so we, because Christ does that for us, we need to come alongside our youth and encourage them and give them opportunities. And when they trip and fall, we need to be there to pick them up, make sure they've got a band-aid for their boo-boo, and move forward in Jesus Christ. And so next week, we are having Youth Emphasis Communion here at the Parish Church. And our youth are going to be um, having a big part of it. And we're inviting other youth to come in so they can learn. And I would ask everyone in the church, if you have adult youth, if you have anyone in, in uh, grandkids, children who don't usually attend here, please invite them. This is going to be a time where we all come together as a family and raise up our youth for Jesus Christ. I hope that this has been a blessing to you today. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the youth of this church. And we know that they are extremely important, that you have chosen them to help spread the word of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And Lord, at this time, we want to ask for a huge double portion of the Holy Spirit on our youth in this church and in, on the youth in the churches 
in Mount Vernon and Cooper. We want to consecrate these young people to you, Lord. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would go into them, surround them, and take care of them, and convict them of what their leadership role might be in the church. That they wouldn't think of this church as their parents' church or their grandparents' church, but they would think of it as their church. That in their heart they would say, this is my church. This is my God. And this is the place where I serve. We ask for this blessing in Christ's name. Amen.